Hello, I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. Welcome to the Urban Agenda. I'm honored to be joined today by a distinguished public servant and a longtime friend, New York City Controller William Thompson. Since January of 2002, he has served as our city's chief fiscal officer, and prior to that, he was the president of the New York City Board of Education. Welcome. Hey, David. How are you? Now, I've just seen a report that just came out of your office saying that the recession is over and that basically we can just go dancing in the streets. No, I don't know that that's what it that's says. That's not what's going to no, happen. I no, wouldn't, I wouldn't start to celebrate yeah. yet. I, I think that technically, if you look at things, that, that the recession's over. We've just gone through ten consecutive quarters of job loss right. over a period of time. And I think what you've seen in the last quarter, the last few months, uh, is, is kind of a stabilizing. We've stopped losing jobs and we've started to gain a few thousand jobs, but we have a long way to go. We just finished a, a survey of low-income New Yorkers. I mm -hmm. guess it just finished in September of, uh, of this year. And what's clearly on their minds uh, is they don't think the, the economy is doing well, and certainly not their economic prospects are well. Mm -hmm. Should we be reassuring them that there's going to be a turnaround for, for people who have low-wage jobs or just at the margins? I think that, that, that what we're starting to see is a little bit of a turnaround. I, I wouldn't, as I said, there's no reason to start to celebrate and dance yeah. in the streets. I mean, you look at the city, in some ways our revenues are starting to run ahead of projections by probably $400 million. That's a good news. Right. But at the same point, jobs are still coming back and trickling back slowly. Uh, so I think it's going to be, it's going to take a while for us to be back in full economic stride. The reality is, over the last three years, we've lost a quarter of a million jobs in New York City. Yeah. A number of them low wage jobs, a number of them middle and higher income j jobs. And I, so I think we've lost them across the board. There is no reason to celebrate yet. It is, you know, as I said to people, it's not time to exhale yet. Right. Uh, it, it's time to still be cautious. Do we have any sense of which sectors seem to be showing some signs of health yet? Or it hasn't really? <sighs> it hasn't really shown itself in right. large sectors. I, the, the one thing that you look at, and it, it is in the private sector. Uh, I mean, you know, because you also track public sector, right. and clearly we're still in tough straits there. Well, well that's a, a, a good lead into the question of what does uh, next year's uh, city budget look like? We just went through, obviously, mm -hmm. a pretty terrible time in terms of having to bridge a major deficit, having to come up with more taxes, right. whatever we're calling it. Uh, what does it look like uh, in your view for the coming okay. year? And you're right. I mean, what we've gone through in the last year and a half or so are cuts to services, higher taxes, you know, the old doing more with less. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that in the next fiscal year, the year that starts July 1st of 2004, I think that what you'll see is, that, I mean, the projections, uh, the projections now show us with a $2 billion budget gap, even though now with revenue starting to run a little bit ahead, I think that you can, you know, safely say, okay, that in the end, it will be closer to a billion dollar deficit. And now, you know, that's, that's manageable. You can do that in a number of different ways. So I don't think we're looking at the dire predictions that we were last year, or at least the, the, not predictions, but the outcomes and things that had to be done in the last couple of years. I think you're starting to look at not time to celebrate, not time to add back yet, but we shouldn't look at tax increases and we shouldn't look at major cuts. Right now, I think in, in you know, both hiring freezes and some other things and, and, and not starting to spend like we did in the past, that should get us through the next fiscal year. Now, how does this all mesh with the, the state projection? They, they had an even higher number mm -hmm. in terms of their hole. How does that cross ma crosswalk with our problem? Well, I, th I still think we have to keep an eye on, on the state. Uh, I mean, I think the, their revenues will start to be a little better, but a lot of ours is related to, <coughs> to real estate. They don't have that luxury. <coughs> so I think that in the end, what we need to do, and, and let's not forget, last year the governor tried to undercut New York City. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for the state legislature, uh, we, and, and particularly the Assembly, you know, the Assembly Democrats, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep an eye on them. The one difference is New York City has to have a balanced budget. The state doesn't have that same requirement, and thank goodness for that. But uh, we still need to keep an eye on the state. Their revenue should start to be up a little bit. I don't think, it's gonna, I don't think they're going to be able to grow their way, though, out of the problems that they have right now. Now, we're obviously, uh, from my vantage point at CSS, particularly mm -hmm. interested in very poor people and, and working poor increasingly because of the changes going on. 
What is your take on the general uh, way the Bloomberg administration has addressed the needs of, of those populations, about two million people? I, I think that, if you will, I think the tone is different right. than the past, though I don't know. <laughs> okay, the tone may be right. different, but I don't know that the outcomes are that much different. Mm. I think that in the end there's a concern, but I, if, if you look at what's happened in the last year, year and a half, taxes have gone up. Right. Fees uh, you have a car, and, 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 and you're, you're, you know, ex everything has gone up, whether it, it is parking tickets, whether it's 50%, you know, you know one-third increase, as you point out, on the subway. Right. For poor people in this city, it's gotten harder and harder and harder. And at the same point, you've seen services reduced in different places. And, and, and just as far as benefits, it's gotten tougher and tougher there. So in the end, I just think it has become by nature, by virtue of things that have gone up, it's a harder place to be poor in New York City mm -hmm. these days, as well as what's the definition of poor in New York City? Well, that, uh, that our survey uh, was hitting uh, straight on. Uh, I mean, we took a survey of a thousand people, and it basically, the poor for us were now people who had incomes below 30,000 with a family of three. Mm -hmm. in, in When we were growing up in Brooklyn, that was a middle class exactly. income. And now, now Go and talk to a family of three right. who makes fifty thousand dollars. How do you live in New York City? Yep. Sixty thousand, seventy thousand. The unfortunate thing is that it is a city that becomes tougher and tougher well, to stay a, in. As a matter of fact, you worked with the Department of uh, Homeless Services on a joint initiative. Mm -hmm. I know uh, in, deal, in dealing with the, trying to. Uh, come up with something in terms of affordable housing and uh, well, talk a little bit about A lot that. of that was in, was in working with them to look at the scatter site program right. that they had, which, I mean, we looked at some of the... Well, I think we should explain to the viewers what scatter site is. I mean, they were... It's a lot of what they, and I'd say contract, but it wasn't contract. Right. It was a lot of the landlords that they did to be able to locate people on an... So this, this was for the homeless people who have to stay overnight in the shelters? Or this was for more if you if in apartments on a short-term basis, and they just kind of lock in landlords in different places right. without virtue of, of larger contracts, which... A lot of that, though, allows you to set standards and be able to monitor those standards. We had started to look at that scatter site housing across yeah. the city. And what were you finding? Uh, what we were finding were deplorable conditions in a number of places. And, and just, you know, as you said, what, what we did was a formal audit. It was, as part of a formal audit process, right. you usually don't tell the agency the outcomes until after you finish, and then you sit down with them. In this case, we found some places that were so bad that we considered, yeah. you know, that, that really posed a threat. And they, they were really paying enormous fees to oh, people to providing. If you look at what the costs tend to be in some of these places, it's, you know, $2,500, $3,000 a month in a lot of places for places that, that people should not live in. That's the thing in the end. So what we did there was to reach out to the commissioner, to her right. credit, uh, and in this case also to the mayor. We reached out to the commissioner of, of Homeless Services, Linda Gibson, said, this is what we found, at least in this, in these buildings, people shouldn't be in there. Their inspectors have been out and found the, you know, those facilities acceptable, those buildings acceptable. To Linda gives us credit, she went out on her own and took a, and look, took a look and and took people out of those buildings mm -hmm. and just said, no, people should not live in there. And then what we tried to do is to work along with them, number one, to come up with a contract process to make sure that now it creates definable standards and goals and things like that in that. That's number one. But also they made the commitment to get out of scatter site housing within a year and right. a half. And that was something that, you know, w which now puts pressure on them to find permanent housing for individuals rather than just temporary facilities. And that's the thing that I was probably the proudest of. And to, the, and to you know, credit to, to the commissioner as well as to the mayor on this, that's that right. they didn't fight an audit, that they said, let's try and use your audit mm -hmm. to try and create change. And I was very proud to work with them on that. You know, really the, the surge is now a surge in homelessness, obviously, gets to the question of what are we going to do in New York? Uh, we talk about growing up in Brooklyn, I mean, the housing uh, crisis that's developed for working families mm -hmm. and middle class families has just gone out of sight now. Uh, what is your take on what, what ultimately we're going to have to be able to do on, on the housing? In, in the end, this comes down to a question of will and what are priorities. Right. And, and I don't think, uh, and this will take you back to your time in government, uh, since the Koch administration, you haven't seen a focused, targeted housing program that really cuts across 
a uh, number of different areas. And when I say that, it's a question of getting the private sector in the room, getting the developers in the room, getting government in the room and the nonprofit organizations as well as the financing institutions in the room and saying, you know something, it is time to come up with a large-scale housing piece or housing plan for New York City that touches low, moderate, and middle-income housing. And that's what we have to do. In the end, you know, the one thing I'll say that this administration has, I mean, the, the, the Bloomberg administration has talked about housing and started to move in the direction of creating some focus. It's the first time since the Koch administration that that's happened. Yeah. That's what needs to occur to be able to start to deal with the problem as well as to start to look at some of the root problems of homelessness and be able to get there ahead of time before people become homeless and you have to find housing for them. That's what we need to do. It's very interesting. I mean, uh, and this is uh, primarily a state problem, but it's also a Bloomberg problem. I mean, we after 9-11, we had this big infusion of money that was supposed to help rebuild Lower Manhattan, and uh, it was billions of dollars involved. Uh, we've been tracking what happened to the residential side of those subsidies. Um, the average apartment being built there, you'd have to uh, basically starts at a million dollars. So it is, it, that, that's almost uh, war profiteering. Uh, I've never seen anything quite like it, of using subsidized, deep subsidies to build luxury. Not, not even luxury, actually, it's super luxury, because it p really puts you beyond just the, the mm -hmm. realm of, of just being wealthy. There's still a lot of liberty bond right. capacity that's left. Uh, and one of, the, uh, one of the things that I had advocated, when you looked at right. how we have to better utilize and the report that we did after September 11th, the set, two years later, what's happened, what needs to happen, and what we got from the federal government, we've got to use that to be able to do some affordable housing around the city of New York. Right. It is, you know, the original intent to be able to do commercial and some residential development in lower Manhattan. Some of it is going to be possible, but there's going to be so much capacity that's not there because right now the economy is not good enough right. for people to build and build new commercial space. There's enough vacant commercial space around the city of New York that what we should do is to use that for affordable housing in New York City. But it's interesting, almost you can't get people to be embarrassed about this stuff, even in these kinds of conditions when homelessness is surging at, at unparalleled rates. New York City right now, and the thing that, that we continue to run the risk of, and you see it more and more, is that the middle class are getting priced out of New York City, and that what happens is that in, cre and in greater numbers, poor people, and particularly working poor, can't stay in New York City either. Absolutely. We'll be right back to continue the urban agenda. Are your kids getting enough art? Whether through poetry, dance, music, or drama, the arts open the doors to creativity. As a mother and teacher, I know that arts education can help our children develop confidence and a better understanding of the world around them. Even if you have just 30 minutes a week, get your kids more involved in the arts and think about the kind of world we can leave behind for our children and our children's children. Art. Ask for more. AmericansfortheArts.org. My special guest for this edition of the Urban Agenda is William Thompson, the New York City Controller. Bill, it wouldn't, we couldn't have a, you know, a show like this without talking to you about public education in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. You were, for many years, the, the head of the Board of Ed. Uh, obviously, there are major changes that have been uh, brought forward by uh, Mayor Bloomberg in this area. Mm -hmm. What's your take on public education and where it's going? All right. I mean, right now, I think that, you know, the, the grade is an incomplete. Uh, it's probably too early to say. I mean, the mayor getting control of the depart of what was the Board of Education, right. now the Department of Education, I had supported that. Uh, when I became president in 96, I had pushed to really create more of a centralized situation, put someone in charge of the chancellor. Right, right now, the mayor's in charge. Uh, and I think that's important to kind of centralize that responsibility. Some of the problems, though, is, you know, I think that they're trying to do so many things so quick, so quickly. I'm not sure they can accomplish that. Mm. So when you have a new, ma you know, new math and reading curriculum and you're trying to do that all at the same time without providing the adequate training to the teachers to be able to do that, as well as you're trying to create such a regimented structure, I have, you know, I have real concerns about that. So I, I think that whether it is, I mean, it's something I support as far as trying to move education forward. It is probably the most important thing to this city. But the jury's still out in the end as, as to whether or not this is the way to go, whether these new curriculums and, and how regimented they are are what's going to be good for children. And then in the end, one of the real questions that I have, um, that they're going to testing 
four and five times a year right now, right. almost in practice tests. In the end, if scores go up, is it because we've just taught children to take tests better? Uh, or, we are, or is it really that we're improving content? The bottom line is we want to improve content. I mean, clearly the mayor and, and yourself have caught the public's m mood. Again, based upon our survey, the, the, the grading actually mm -hmm. got picked up by the New York Post of all things. We don't generally <laughs> get quoted very much in the New York Post, but right. they said, I mean, uh, parents, poor parents that we interviewed, uh, you know, essentially fail education. Mm -hmm. They see uh, education is really not preparing their kids for any kind of productive work. And so I think, you know, his, his reforms clearly are, are falling on a particularly uh, fertile kind of uh, 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 ground among the, uh, the poor and the working poor particularly. Well, th there is no greater way, uh, I think you and I have seen it, there's no greater way out of poverty than through e except through education. Right. Uh, in, and for too many years, I mean over a period of decades, public schools have failed poor children. And if you look at where the failing schools are in New York City, the, the vast majority of them are in poor communities. Uh, you know, so that's what's occurred over a period of time. You know, you started to move in a direction to try and improve it and focus and do things like creating what was called the Chancellor's District then, right. putting extra resources into failing schools. And no, those schools were coming up. That's ended now. So the jury, as I said, is out. But at the same point, I think we all have to remain supportive of the mayor and the chancellor in education because at the very well, least a, right now. A tougher issue, particularly mm -hmm. for a Democrat. What about his relationship with the unions here? You know, in the end, I think that when I was here, I had a good relationship with, with the unions, and they moved along in a number of innovative, progressive ideas with us to benefit children. Mm -hmm. Right now, I don't think you can run a school system and have an, a totally antagonistic relationship with with your teachers. Those are the people that are in front of students every day. If kids learn, it is because of the teacher that stands in front of them. And if you tell them that that you're at war with them, if you tell them that they don't have value, if you tell them that you don't value the work that they do, mm -hmm. it helps to demoralize them. So, you know, all of that goes into it. Into, I mean, the jury clearly is out. If I were in their shoes, I'd sit with the union tomorrow and attempt to start to, you know, work out a much better relationship. It isn't a question of caving in. It's a question of establishing a better mm -hmm. relationship and work together on behalf of children. That's what we have to do right now. It, there's, an, there's another question I have. Obviously, the mayor has put a lot of political capital on uh, mm -hmm. transforming. I think you and I, when I was head of youth services, you clearly in your work in Board of Ed, you've disinvested from this system for decades. How long will it take, even if you hit a home run here, in terms of actually being able to show significant outcomes that can turn people's lives around? What, what, what's the turnaround? What I'm, what I'm concerned about is, Reform has to come, but people have to be told there's a lot of damage that's been laid down here. I think that if you look, there is, and, and the one thing, there's no quick fix uh, in education. And I think that, you know, that the mayor sitting there and saying, geez, give me, you know, my, my term, and if things haven't dramatically improved, you shouldn't vote for me again. I, I think that might have been a little simplistic as you looked at it. I mean, th th in the end, what we've got to do is to really, once again, I mean, things that I would started and worked on, and, right. and chances like Harold Levy and Rudy Crew before them, improving and working with teachers so you have better trained teachers and better teacher quality, more certification of teachers, working at some of the fundamentals and reading and making sure children and teachers understand that. Those are things that you have to do and build into a system. And what you saw over a period of time was gain in reading uh, against tougher, higher new standards. Hopefully you can see that again. But in the end, there are no quick fixes. Anything doesn't, you know, young people don't wake up one day and all of a sudden they're smarter. They, they, they have natural amount of intelligence to begin with. The question is how do we teach them and then build on that foundation over yeah, a period of I time. I think particularly for those kids who are now, who have gotten essentially math for consumers and are being asked to do pre-calc on the Regents exam. Exactly. The question is, once a child who's been, or a young adult, mm -hmm. has been put in this position, isn't there a, a, a societal responsibility, at least to provide transition? I mean, I've been, whether it's foster care kids who, when I was on, right. on my watch in the Koch administration and youth services, uh, when we were coming along, HRA used to give a bank book with $200 in it and a short course in how to rent an apartment. And that was, the, you were thrown out in the street at 16 or 17. And it's not surprising that if you look at the incarceration rates of many of the young people who are in prison now, a lot of them have been in foster care, which 
really raises the question. I mean, essentially, we were the responsible for young people who we failed entirely. Mm -hmm. The question is, should we start focusing on, as we look at education and reform, the moral responsibility to help youngsters who are not going to be appreciably helped by reform? Don't we have an obligation in job training and supports and scholarships and the rest to this group that we've really failed? Absolutely. You have, you have responsibility to them. You have responsibility to young people within your system right now, also within your school system, who aren't in first, second, third grade right. where you're going to be able to deal with fundamentals and help them there, but students who are in 10th, 11th, 12th grade who a system hasn't provided for as much as it should have, you've got to work with them now. In job training, you've got to work with them. In fundamental skills, let's go back with some of the, how well do you read? Let's evaluate that and put them in whether it is an extended day, whether it's after school, whether it's, it's job. Right, you have to. Absolutely. A, a, a 16 year old, it's not fair. I, I just, it, I bridle you know, at it. It is one of the areas that, 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 that young people have been, and particularly over the last five, six, seven years that, that, we've, that, that this city has failed, uh, it's young people, is in job training, and it's not just in young people, it's across the board. If, you know, if, you're, if people have talked about, you're, okay, you're going to come off of welfare, well, where's the job training that's attached to that to provide you for, or, or to be able to help you provide for the future? Those are all important things. There's a controversy that's, that's come up in education between you and the administration, and I guess it can be characterized as the, uh, the great uh, Snapple T <laughs> issue. Uh, would, would you explain the nature of the controversy? Okay. I, I, all our viewers may not know it. But. Okay, and quickly, what, what New York City, what the public school system did, the Department of Education, was to sit down, without going through a public process, uh, reach out supposedly through a marketing agent that they hired uh, to different juice and, and fruit and water providers in, in iced tea. In the end, what they did was to come up with a contract, uh, which really the questions of the conflict of interest and were d each was each vendor given the same information. Clearly not. So this was and, an exclusive, basically, that every kid in the system would would get Snapple. Or here that that will be sold at Snapple, not iced tea but Snapple, a new fruit juice that they're going to provide, is what the city will contract with them on city school property. So vending machines, lunchrooms, other places like that. Snapple will, is going to be there for children to, to buy. Well, Snapple, as a mess, Snapple, this new fruit juice, which they didn't have before and just created, uh, and, and questions of propriety, questions of fairness. and. What was the process? In the end, they'll tell you almost that there were no rules to the process. They could almost do what they want, and that's, in fact, what they've said. And then they took that, that agreement for $40 million with New York City Public Schools and said, geez, we like this. Let's take this citywide. So Snapple, then, they have worked into a contract that they're bringing forward now for $120 million to provide Snapple iced tea and Snap 2.0, their water product, uh, in every city building and, and in, in vending machines across the city of New York with, once again, no process. It is astonishing that uh, in this day and age, and a huge Do you, you think this was conscious, or is this just people who have never been in government before? No, I think that this, is, this was conscious. I think that, in, in fact, in the administration, in their testimony over the last few days, have just said, we think this was the best thing, and that's what we, and that's what we did, and no one can tell us that we can't. That's what's happened. It, so that a deal, basically, for $160 million with Snapple has been done with no public disclosure, no oversight almost, and they're continuing to move forward. The $40 million piece, Snapple is already, vending machines are in the schools. They've moved forward on that. The other piece, the $120 million piece, which does need at least the Franchise Committee's approval, uh, Franchise Review Committee's approval, is coming in, in uh, you know, I think uh, next week. And uh, they. And so, so when is this all going to come to a head, in your view, as oh, controller? I, th I think this comes to a head in the next week to two weeks. Uh, I think in the end they're moving this through the Franchise Review Committee. Uh, two days after the presentation, they're going to move it for a vote. And that's where things stand right now. So I think that in the end it is coming to a head quickly. The administration has said, you know, we didn't have to go through a process. This is what we're going to do. It's a sole source deal, end of conversation. It is, it is in this day and age, particularly when this is a major branding effort to identify Snapple with New York City, and they're going to take this deal and replicate it in other places across the city for other things. One would think that you'd want to establish a blueprint that 
uh, that you could follow later and that people would have faith in the integrity of the process. You see, uh, it goes back to the time as Youth Service Commissioner when I couldn't, you couldn't have lunch for more than five dollars with people. It, it sounds well, it sounds like we've we're, I, the idea of having no bid contracts for that size of uh, there, investment. There are things that are just coming out. The, the marketing agent is being paid seven million dollars. It's just things that no one knew. Well, that it's astonishing. We'll tune in next day. <laughs> <laughs> My thanks to Bill Thompson, the controller of the City of New York. I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society, and thank you for watching the Urban Agenda. <laughs>